Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 25 of our discussion of Morgoth's Ring. <clears throat> I had um, said that my plan and hope was that we would get to Myths Transform tonight. I still retain that hope, but I have to confess that when I made that rash statement, I forgot that there was the whole narrative between Manwe and Eru in, like, squeezed into that, like, a, you know, appendix business after the... Anyway, so I'm not skipping that. So anyway, we'll see. We'll see. At the very least... We will we will we will fully be prepared uh, for myths transformed. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to. I'm not uh, as as you've been able to detect, doubtless at some point before now in our Morgoth Ring discussion. Uh, I am not in a rush when it comes to this book. I have been enjoying this thoroughly, and there is so much to think about and so much of a you know, a, a very sort of deep and abstract kind, right? Um, and even challenging and emotional kind. So uh, it's, um, yeah, not something to rush through. No apologies. Okay, um, so I'm, we're going to uh, jump back. We're going to go back into the tale of Adonel, uh, the tale of the fall of man, uh, uh, very soon. First, uh, let me just do... Uh, let me talk a little bit more about Signum and the higher education situation. I've been doing this, as I told you, for now the last three weeks. And I've been going through a series of problems in higher education, either problems created by higher education or problems that have arisen for higher education. Uh, and uh, this week, in my broadcast this week, I am talking about sort of backstage problems. There are a lot of problems that are you know, external, that everybody can see. Things like the student debt issue, things like the challenges with remote learning, like I talked about in the first week. Um, this week I'm talking about backstage ones, uh, things which not everybody sees, but which are pretty significant problems. Last night I talked about uh, the disproportion of university administrators, the whole bloat of administrations of universities, and coupled with both the, both the increase in numbers of administrators and the increase in their salaries, creates some financial challenges uh, for, uh, for universities. Um, and um, the um, the tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is something that. So I talked about the administ the problem with administrators last time, uh, and of course, you know, I speak feelingly as you know someone who's kind of an administrator myself. Um, certainly, I'm on that side of the fence and understand the situation there. Um, anyway, tonight, what I want to talk about is the the faculty staff divide um, this is a much older problem than the administrative problem the problem with university administrations has really arisen in recent years as universities have more and more attempted to model themselves after a corporate model uh, but the divide the problem of the divide between faculty and staff uh, goes back a long time this is an old old problem um, and to kind of contextualize it to kind of understand where it comes from. You have to think back to how higher education was like a hundred years ago. And for some in our audience, uh, there will be some ways to uh, think about this. Um, one of the one of the best illustrations I can think of of what I'm pointing to here uh, is in C.S. Lewis uh, in that hideous strength. Uh, Bracton College at Edgestow University. Uh, in uh, uh, in that hideous strength. Now, of course, nobody, least of all Lewis, uh, would point to uh, uh, Bracton College as sort of typical and exemplary for higher education. Um, but it was he, in describing it, he was describing, as he says in the prologue of that book, like the normal everyday world that he knows. Right. And one of the things that you can notice about Bracton College and that hideous strength uh, is that it's completely run by the faculty, right? The college 
is the faculty. Like, that's what it means. So when there's a college meeting, it means all of the faculty are getting together to meet, right? Who is the leader? Who are the leaders of the university? They are those members of the faculty who step forward. Um, so again, in, in that hideous strength, when we meet like the warden and the uh, and the subwarden, and the, well, we don't actually meet the warden, but we meet the subwarden. And we meet the uh, the bursar, right? Uh, these people who are making, who are basically making the decisions uh, for the institution and running things and stuff like they're faculty members. They're they're fellows of the university who also have taken on uh, these leadership roles, um, with. Of course, in that book, largely disastrous results uh, for the decisions made by those particular people. But, uh, but again, the point is, in the old days, higher education, what, like the professors were, yeah, like there was no like other administrative class above the faculty. The faculty were the leaders of the institution, like they were the institution, they were the college. But they had servants, right? There were also a lot of servants <clears throat> who did a lot of the the more menial work. <clears throat> Excuse me, whether that's like cooking and cleaning or maintaining the grounds or serving as door porters uh, or, uh, or serving as secretaries uh, and assistants and things like that. Um, you know, there were lots of servants around. So you've had the faculty and then you had the faculty servants. And that basically, that's the root of the modern day divide between staff and faculty at colleges. And it's still really obvious, even in American schools, uh, which are not quite as firmly rooted uh, in that kind of system. Nevertheless, the same kind of traditions uh, have contributed to this really pretty remarkable divide where within a university, almost all universities, I've never even known a university where this wasn't true. There are two totally different classes of employee that are treated completely like they're under completely different terms of employment. Um, there isn't even the vaguest gesture towards equity between this one group of employees and this other group of employees, that is the faculty and the staff. Um, it's not just a question, you know, there are some big obvious issues, right? It's not just a question of like one group can get tenure and the other group can't get tenure. It's not just a question even of one group gets paid much higher salaries and the other group gets paid much lower salaries, even though both are dwarfed by the administrators these days. Um, it's not even about that kind of pay and equity. I mean, again, those things are all really important, too. But it goes even even deeper than that. They operate under different rules. They uh, work by entirely different pay structures, like one is salaried and the other works hourly. One, the one are at will employees and the others are not. I mean, it's like on the, like all the way down to the ground. Uh, the whole manner of employment is completely different different. Um, and it creates, it means that one of the things, like one of the fundamental realities of life working at most universities is a world of inequity, a world in which, which is absolutely not a level playing field in which everybody is not treated the same at all. And sometimes that can, um, take on some really uncomfortable edges. I mean, I myself have worked at a university, for instance, that had a, a faculty that was like 90% white being served by a staff, which was like 75% black being paid very, very little. Uh, that's really uncomfortable. That's very uncomfortable. There's I, anyway, just, there's just, there's lots of um, uh, ways in which this, that, fundamental inequity can lead to broad inequities across the board. Um, and of course, one of the other results is a helplessly divided workforce. Uh, in most cases, you've got two groups of workers who are both working for the college, but they, they don't relate. They can't relate to each other. They're not operating on anything like the same level. Um, uh, in fact, they end up operating almost in parallel, like living in almost completely separate worlds. In some places, it's almost eerie how separate those words, those worlds are. Um, this is one of the things at Signum. There are some things at Signum, so some ways in which Signum is different, some of the ways in which we've addressed some of these problems that we've kind of 
you know, sort of settled into over the years. We didn't even necessarily sort of start off with that as a priority or something like that. But this is something that I've always felt really strongly about as we've been starting from scratch and saying, how are we going to organize ourselves? How are we going to run ourselves? This is one of those things that I have kind of, you know, uh, put my foot on the ground and said, no, I'm not going to replicate that. I'm not going to go out of my way to recreate that kind of inequity, that kind of really strained um, and polarized work environment. I would like to break down that divide. Uh, and so Signum has set out to treat all employees the same. We not only all operate on the same pay scale um, using exactly the same pay calculation formula, um, we also have the same expectations, the same kinds of framework. Um, uh, again, everybody, the same set of rules applies to everybody, the same structure, the same. And this includes things like flexibility, like the flexibility of time off. Faculty have more time, more flexibility with their time off uh, than staff do normally. We don't have that inequity. Uh, the staff has the same kind of flexibility uh, that faculty have. Um, we have faculty and staff working together in the same systems, right? That is to say, we don't have like, here's the faculty committee over here and here's the staff uh, team over here. Um, they're all they're all working together. So we have like the same like you know, staff and faculty working together, but they're also the same people, right? We've got a faculty role and we've got staff roles. Um, everybody at SIGDOM does more than one role. I mean, that's kind of how it works. And in fact, the way that I uh, have it designed is for uh, for all faculty to also be doing staff roles. Like they don't just serve on useless committees. This was one of my personal pet peeves um, uh, as a former faculty member. Um, no time wasting committees. Instead, our faculty, instead of serving on time wasting committees, are just going to like work <laughs> with the staff on things that are important that the staff are doing, you know, like with the, so again, like the, so one person is, uh, is, is, you know, they're teaching classes over here and they're working in this system over here. It's a much more egalitarian system, um, which in which I'm really trying to obliterate the distinction entirely between faculty and staff. They're all employees. They are all, we are all working together. Um, so instead of this really, tense standoff, which is very normal at schools between the faculty and the staff and then the administration up here. You've got those three poles, right, of this uh, this really awkward system um, and a lot of um, a lot of tension, a lot of even hostility between those different groups of people. Um, then uh, uh, we're, we're trying to eliminate that entirely. And we all just work together on the same pay scale. I keep saying on the same pay scale, which is true. But of course, at Signum, we go further than that. Um, we don't only just pay everybody using the same formula, which we do. We also have part of our formula. Um, we have a we have a, a cap involved. That is, uh, Signum's pay scale is based upon a fundamental ratio. That is, we have a we have a rule that says the highest paid person at Signum cannot make more than a certain proportion of what the lowest paid person at Signum makes. In many universities, you will see the president of the university being paid 40 times, 50 times, 100 times in some cases, what the lowest paid person at the university is making. Um, and that's not right. That's not okay. So we have a set proportion right now. It's pretty low. Uh, um, and, um, and, and, and we maintain that. So th this doesn't mean we put, a, an artificial ceiling on the top of what the top people can make. They're welcome to make more. It just means we have to pay the lowest paid people more too. Uh, and you know, to maintain the, uh, uh to make, to maintain the proportion. So Anyway, again, I, like our philosophy is just, different at Signum. Um, now, you're right, Stephen, this does create that problem. Stephen points out that if faculty and staff, you know, are treated equally, then how does anyone feel superior to everyone else? And that is a challenge. Um, but um, yeah, I, you know, we'll, 
We'll find ways. I'm confident that we'll overcome that challenge in time, Stephen. Um, but um, anyway, I, you know, I, and I, I think that there are some people whose first reaction to like hearing me say that we're wanting to obliterate the distinction between faculty and staff um, might feel that that's bad. You know, that it's sort of like the final erosion of faculty standing, you know, that the preservation of faculty rights and faculty standing, because it has been something that has been steadily eroding as the administrative class gets more and more power over institutions and they succeed in marginalizing the faculty more and more. Um, yeah, absolutely, that is happening. But this is not, Signum's step is not like, you know, the final step in destroying the traditional fac uh, faculty. We believe in upholding the dignity and importance of the faculty. Uh, it's just the thing is, we also believe in upholding the dignity and importance of the staff as well. Um, we, uh, we, we absolutely want to treat the faculty with respect, and, and we want them very much to be involved in the leadership and in the guidance of the institution. I, I'd like them to be as involved as they possibly could be. And you know what? I'd like the staff to be as involved as they possibly could be, too. Um, so anyway, um, that's um, that's that's how things happen here at Signum. You know, we've, uh, you know, tried to create this new system in which all voices are heard and respected. And it's. It's pretty different, but this is this is one of the things, you know, again, like this is not a problem people talk about a lot in higher education, but it's a deep problem in higher education. And it's it's time. It's time for this to go. It really is. Um, and we can make it we can do better. And so at Signum, we're trying to do better uh, for this stuff. But all right. Anyway, that's um, uh, that's the end of tonight's story of the problems. And this has been another session of the problems in higher education. Um, now, uh, Jocelyn, you had asked a, a really great question. Is there any benefit uh, uh, to us for donors to give during the fund drive as opposed to any other time of year? Okay, so <laughs> normally, no, today the band broke down. No, um, so normally... Uh, so I, no, the answer is no. The big general answer is no. Um, this is the time of year in which I remind everybody to donate because I don't like to, I mean, I'm not afraid to ask people to donate to Signum, but at the same time, I don't want to be like pestering y'all for money every week all year long. Um, that just doesn't feel right to me. Uh, so for me, the campaign season is like, this is the time every year when I remind everybody that we need donations. Um, so that's the primary function of, uh, of the fund. The reason I hesitate, Jocelyn, is that we are, as I said at the beginning, we are, we have begun the accreditation process, which is expensive. Uh, and the costs for that are going to be coming sooner rather than later. Uh, so in that way, uh, it is, um, uh, there's a little bit of a, strongish desire uh, for us to to be closer, you know, as close as we can get to our goal sooner rather than later. But um, but even that, it's not like the end of the world. Um, our fiscal year runs through July. Um, so we're we're uh, uh, and certainly a gift in, you know, December or February or April will be just as welcome uh, as now. Um, so if if there are reasons like for, you know, for people's own financial reasons, why waiting is better, don't feel bad about that. That's totally fine. And of course, I know often um, I may, of course, come back to reminding you uh, about the possibility of donating as we get into December and closer to the end of the year um, when Many people are thinking about tax issues there as we come towards the end of December. Um, but anyway, however it works best, you know, in um, your own uh, finances, of course, is obviously something that we understand. And it's not going to uh, it's not going to be like destructive for us or something. We're not going to lose uh, by that, I think. But um, yeah, good. Anyway, um, Cool. Hey, Brandon, glad you could be caught up. That's excellent. Um, Michelle, uh, great question. Michelle is asking about our new uh, Signum store and wondering how much does revenue uh, from the store and other such uh, merch sales figure into overall revenues? Well, it's small. I mean, we don't get a, like a massive, per th though I have to say I've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, some of you who have been around a very long time might remember that we had an online store years ago, like eight years ago. Um, 
And from that one, we got like pennies, like penny. I, I think for like all of the sales combined we ever made on that site was like, I'm not even sure we got a hundred bucks total ever in the history of that site. It was awful. Uh, the It was like, there was almost no point to uh, running the store at all um, from a revenue standpoint. Um, the Redbubble store is, I'm a big fan of Redbubble. They've been doing a great job. I think their, their stuff is good. Um, their system seems to work really well. Um, and we do get a more significant, a more generous percentage. Percentage. Um, so it's, um, it's, uh, um, yeah. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So, um, anyway, so it's, uh, it's, it's been good, but, but Michelle, as far as like how significant, I mean, it's, uh, it's just kind of an, an excellent extra revenue stream. Um, but it's not a major revenue stream by any stretch. I mean, who knows? The day may come when, you know, we've got Balrogs don't have wings shirts across the globe and, uh, you know, and then it'll be major, but it's, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, uh, you know, let's see, what do we, we probably get like a dollar or two, basically, you know, maybe we average something like a dollar an item, depending on the size of the item, of course, the bigger items a little bit more, the smaller items a little bit less, something like that, vaguely. Um, but, you know, it adds up, actually, it adds up. We have, uh, we've been able to uh, uh, pay one of our people to maintain the uh, the merchandise and do, uh, there's a bunch of back stage stuff that has to be done uh, to keep the store running. And so we've been able to pay somebody to do And I love paying people. My favorite thing uh, is to be able to pay folks. So um, it's been great. You know, it's, it's, it's funding that and, and uh, a little bit extra left over. So um, that's been, um, that's been awesome. Um, hey, Marianne, that's a great, uh, why don't you, um, Marianne, why don't you email uh, Sharon about that um, at uh, info at signumu.org and she can help you with that, definitely, with uh, placing orders and stuff. Um, cool. Cool. Excellent. Um, all right. So thank you, everybody who has uh, donated. It's always um, so uh, delightful uh, to see the, um, to see the donations come in. Uh, I mean, of course, obviously it's wonderful for, pra for practical purposes as, you know, I'm looking at the Signum budget and I'm trying to figure out how we're going to pay for everything and how we're, you know, we're, we're continuing to, uh, to transition more and more of our staff from volunteer to paid staff. And that's been a massive priority of mine and, uh, and we're underway with that. And it's very exciting. Um, uh, but of course, just as much as the practical benefit of the donations, it is uh, just such a personal encouragement to me and I know to everybody who works at Signum to just see the support from everybody. Um, and we really, really value that. Uh, it is uh, it means a lot. Uh, to me when you guys to see donations come in. So thank you guys for everything that you have uh, you have been able to do. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Marianne, don't worry about it. Send her an email and she'll she'll help you out. No problem. Okay, excellent. Then let us go back to the tale of Adonel. We had just gotten to the giver of gifts, Mark One, right? Uh, when um, uh, and how the gifts were given, and you will remember how uh, Morgoth, posing as the giver of gifts, was not just taking up a like kindly and inoffensive front. Right. Um, he was there uh, deliberately undermining the plans of Iluvatar. Right. Uh, Eru wanted them to grow and to learn on their own. Um, them, dis them discovering things, um, them discovering things was his plan. Right. Them learning and becoming wise on their own uh, was his plan. Um, and so by coming and De declaring himself the giver of gifts and thus making the men dependent upon him, um, Morgoth was deliberately undermining uh, the uh, uh, the plans, the whole purpose and development of the human race. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Arthur asks, is this where Sauron got the idea retroactively? Yeah, apparently, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, this does, of course, historically predate uh, within the frame of Middle-earth um, Sauron's Anatar ploy. Um, but you'll notice again how 
in establishing this parallel, rather than just like, you know, hitting the play it again button, right? And doing the same thing, Tolkien is transforming that thing, right? Again, when Sauron approaches Celebrimbor, with which, of course, we don't have a real narrative for, um, nothing other than the, you know, of the Rings of Power and the Third Age synopsis uh, in the Silmarillion. Um, but uh, when Sauron approaches Celebrimbor, um, he does seem to be primarily just trying to put him off his guard, right? Hi, look, I'm friendly, right? I'm, I'm generous. I'm helpful. Let me help you. Um, whereas when Tolkien goes to do that same thing the second time, he doesn't just repeat it a second time or, of course, chronologically a first time. Uh, he transforms it into something much more... Um, much more focused. He makes, in retrospect, Sauron's primary and famous use of that same ploy look merely derivative. And that's amazing, right? Uh, he creates a, a deeper, richer, more significant, earlier version of this so that the version we're already all of us familiar with as we read this text um, uh, begins to look like a pale shadow compared to this second one, right? I mean, that's kind of amazing, right? I think that's really, really well done. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Um, now, Michael says, the impatience of men for the time frame, that is, like, how long it takes to like become wise rather than just being given gifts uh, stands in stark contrast to elvish nature. Uh, could that be a sign of their mortality from the start? Well, Michael, it could be, but I think here, I think, I think what Finrod would say is it's not a sign of their, um, uh, of their mortality. It's a sign of the difference of their perspective, right? The, that different relationship that they have with Arda. Um, that uh, they no, they don't share the sort of innate love for Arda, which drives the elves continuously, right, to pursue and deepen their relationship with Arda. Remember, it's all about love with the elves, not about study with the elves. It's all about love. In fact, if you know, if you think about like um you know, a sort of clinical distancing or like scholarly dis distancing from the thing that you're studying, right? You've got to, you've got to remain dispassionate about the thing that you study, whatever it is. Um, that at least is the sort of the modern human idea. Um, elves are the absolute opposite, right? They get to know their own, if you want to call them scientific, scientific studies of the world, are based on, that's like them pursuing a long-term relationship with the world, right? It's because uh, they wouldn't say they are interested in this thing. They would say they are in love with this thing, right? This is a reflection of their love for Ardo. Um, and so the joy which Eru says the men will experience through their discovery of things and through becoming wise is of a different kind, than the joy that the elves feel, and in some ways, perhaps less natural, right? Less automatic for the men than for the elves, um, which again seems to me to be connected to that difference in psychology that that uh, Finrod was describing, which was f which is rooted in that difference of spiritual framework, um, I, I, according to Finrod and Andreth's conversation. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, um, so, okay, anyway, um, let me, let's move on, let's continue our discussion by moving on here. All that he taught seemed good, for he had great knowledge, but ever more and more he would speak of the dark. Greatest of all is the dark, he said, for it has no bounds. I came out of the dark, but I am its master, for I have made light. I made the sun and the moon and the countless stars. I will protect you from the dark, which else would devour you. Then we spoke of the voice, but his face became terrible, for he was angry, 
Fools, he said. That was the voice of the dark. It wishes to keep you from me, for it is hungry for you. Then he went away, and we did not see him for a long time, and without his gifts we were poor. And there came a day when suddenly the sun's light began to fail, until it was blotted out, and a great shadow fell on the world, and all the beasts and birds were afraid. Then he came again, walking through the shadow like a bright fire. We fell upon our faces. There are some among you who are still listening to the voice of the dark, he said, and therefore it is drawing nearer. Choose now. Ye may have the dark as lord, or ye may have me. But unless ye take me for lord and swear to serve me, I shall depart and leave you, for I have other realms and dwelling places, and I do not need the earth, nor you. This is my favorite part of the whole tale of Adano, actually. I love, love the eclipse. Love the eclipse and Sauron's use of the eclipse. Um, Sauron's, um, Sauron's discussion. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, sorry, I just missed something on the Twitch chat. David Michael Roberts, I see your comment there. Feel free to reach out to me, actually, by email. Be happy to talk with you about some of the things that you're talking about there. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to just wanted to mention that. Um, don't want to reroute the whole conversation again in that direction, but happy to talk about that. Um, anyway, okay, so what, what Morgoth's approach is here? The audacious turn of the dark and the association of the dark with Eru, right? Because he speaks out of the dark. And Morgoth apparently knows this, right? That, you know, he hasn't, Eru hasn't appeared to them. He's just spoken to them. And they think of it as a voice out of the darkness, right? Um, greatest of all is the dark, for it has no bounds. Greatest of all is the dark. So first he elevates the dark. The dark is the greatest. This is, the, this is his, his teachings, right? As he's giving them gifts, the gifts of knowledge, the gifts of wisdom. And his teaching culminates with, greatest of all is the dark, for it has no bounds. The dark is the biggest thing of all. So, and it sounds at first, right? Especially since, again, I know, like, we can't help ourselves, right? When we are reading the tale of Adano, I mean, I don't know any Tolkien reader who gets to the tale of Adano without having read, you know, the Silmarillion and the, the Akalabath and all that stuff, right? Uh, so... We can't get to the giver of gifts without thinking of Anatar. It's like completely impossible, right? Similarly, I don't know about you, but I certainly can't read this greatest of all is the dark, for it has no bounds. I came out of the dark, but I am its master. I can't hear that without thinking of two things. First, Gollum's darkness riddle. But secondly, Sauron's teaching to Arpharazon in the Akalabath, right? When he um, turns... Uh, the Numenorians, right, turns our pharaohs on to the worship of the dark and of Melkor, the lord of the dark. And so it sounds at first like Melkor is doing a really simple thing, right? That he's doing a really simple thing. So that that, that is the thing that he's doing is just first establishing, you know, making them trust him, making them look up to him, making them dependent upon him, and then elevating himself and bringing them to worship him, right? Greatest of all is the dark, and I am the lord of the dark, therefore I am the greatest of all, right? But that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is much subtler than that, right? He is the master of the dark. He made the light. He is the source of all light. The dark is everything other than him, right? So he he associates himself with the dark. I came out of the dark, right? Establishes his supremacy over the dark. I am its master. Not because I am the greatest of all the dark things, but because I am the enemy of the dark. That's the unexpected turn, right? He claims the light, not the darkness. I made the sun and moon and the countless stars. I will protect you from the dark. So he elevates the dark, not to elevate himself directly, but to but to build up their own fears, which then, again, he can make them more dependent upon him. He is the only one. He is the only light in the darkness. He is the only one who can possibly protect them from the dark. Um, 
And uh, yeah, Stephen, we can see in this a sort of projection almost, right? Um, Morgoth's own desires, his own ambitions, perhaps almost, um, becoming audible here. Um, uh, him projecting just a tiny bit, perhaps in some ways. Um, yeah, yeah. Devorah, yes, he creates a need and then fills it, right? Exactly, exactly. This is a much more compelling, much more subtle approach than, hi, I'm pretty wonderful, aren't I? Don't you think I'm wonderful? I am super powerful, right? Worship me, right? I mean, that's a, you know, it's a reasonable trajectory. It's not different, that different from how Sauron worked, right, with the Numenorians. Um, but, um, but yeah, Giant 98, exactly. He's creating the fear of the dark. He is making the darkness fearful, which based on what we've seen, if anything, the, the men would have had the opposite association, right? The voice that was, you know, kind of uncompromising maybe in some ways, but this voice that taught them came out of the dark. Um, so why would they have any negative associations with the dark, right? So he teaches them to fear it and then offers to protect them from it. Um, I will protect you from the dark, which else would devour you. And then, of course, this not only builds himself up, but sets up his next move. Yeah, that voice, that is the voice of the dark. It wishes to keep you from me, for it is hungry for you. Right. And again, really simple to say, because they were already feeling frustrated. Right. Um, he's already established. I am the better, the better giver of gifts. Right. I'm the one who's on your side. Is the voice in the dark on your side? Doesn't seem like it. Right. Um, uh, it is trying to keep you from me. And of course, it's perfectly true that the voice of the dark wants to keep them from him. Right. Absolutely true. And this, of course, is one of the things that we can see all the way through, right? The very clever way in which Melkor's lies are based on truth. Um, he did come out of the dark, right? Um, he is the master of the dark. Uh, he, uh, um, uh, the voice of the dark from the dark does wish to keep them from him. Um, even the hunger. Yeah, it's like a little true. In a way, it's true that the voice of the dark is hungry for them. Um, it does want them, uh, the, you know, this it's it's not neutral towards them. Um, but of course, uh, he's giving an extremely warped version of this. And Josiah, of course, reminds us, though it's not emphasized uh, in the text here, that he has the Silmarils. Right. So he has these radiant gems shining in the darkness um, as an excellent way to back up his claims that he is the light. Right. This light, which is, remember, it's more pure, like this light of the sun and moon themselves are derivative of um, even the light of the stars. Derivative of the light, which is captured in the light of the Silmarils. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. And Stephen, you're right. He's turning the fear of the Lord uh, into an ironic phrase. He's he's trying to at the same time that he is undermining and twisting Iluvatar's actions and motivations, he's also twisting their own response, right? The fear of the Lord, this veneration and very deep and profound respect for the voice is natural to them, right? Is a good thing. And he's turning the one fear to this other simpler kind of fear. Um, Yes, and Jennifer, you're right. Jennifer Pope points out that this is very similar to uh, the strategy that Tolkien gave in the notes, right, to the commentary um, about how he suborned the other powers, right? Um, teach them to fear Eru and turn to him for protection, and then when they realize the truth, they're too afraid to turn back. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, now, David, I agree. There's, It's a little uncertain about the timing um, as to, like, when exactly, how long ago 
it was that the men awoke, but I think that he would have had, I mean, it depends. We're not given an exact date, right? Of when exactly the humans awoke or how long this was after they awoke that he came to them. Um, but the, um, uh, the, references at the end, which I hope we'll get to here tonight, um, the references at the end of the story suggest to me that the time of this happening is not that long um, prior to the humans arriving in Beleriand. Um, it's not like the day before yesterday either, but I don't think it was, you know, like millennia ago by any means. Um, that's not my impression. But again, the dates are kind of unclear here. Um, anyway, okay. Um, but the one thing I will say, David, the fact that the Silmarils don't come in for more, um, uh, flamboyant description, um, in the story is, uh, interesting. You know, I would, I would, I would, I would expect that to be emphasized perhaps a little bit more. Um, but I do think it's possible. I do think that this could very well date from the time after, um, after Morgoth's return to Beleriand, uh, following the darkening of Eleanor. No, in fact, we know it is, because we know that the men awoke with the sun. So the earliest point, it's the time of the rising of the sun is the earliest point at which men would have awakened. So he would definitely have had the Silmarils with him. In fact, we can say it the other way around. It is impossible that Morgoth could possibly have come to them prior to obtaining the Silmarils, um, because the sun arose after he was already back in Beleriand. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I'm talking myself through uh, the whole thing here. Yep, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, David, we'll get back to the permanent sun universe later. You're right. That's an issue. But we'll um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, but continuing to go here. Um, so then he leaves them, right? Um, his use of the eclipse. Again, I love his use of the eclipse. Um, to take the moment when it looks like the darkness is winning. So he's planted very firmly in their hearts the fear of the dark, and he set himself up as the only one who can oppose it, right? The one who is its master, the one who uh, has brought forth the light to, to, to combat the darkness. Um, and then he returns to them on the day in which it looks like the darkness is overtaking the sun itself. Um, and he comes radiant with light, uh, like a bright fire walking through the shadow and comes to them and says, this is happening because some of you are still listening to the voice of the dark. That that touch is wonderful, I think. Um, Unless ye take me for Lord and swear to serve me, I shall depart and leave you. Um, for I have other realms and I do not need the earth nor you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it is interesting. David says that um, it's um, that uh, Tolkien is essentially having Morgoth like perverting one of the ten plagues, right? Uh, the ten Old Testament plagues. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Michael, I do agree. I have other realms is really interesting, isn't it? Uh, because, uh, of course, he doesn't. <laughs> actually have other realms. Um, but, um, but more importantly, I think it's a really interesting glimpse into the other side of Morgoth's kind of fantasy world, right? In his fantasy world, he is the owner of light, light belongs to him. Um, I think that that's truly part of like his own personal fantasy world. Um, and also that he is, that this is merely but one of his many domains uh, is also part of his own fantasy world, I think. Um, yeah, and Stephen, absolutely. The cunning of not only getting them to turn to him, but of getting them to turn against any who hold out uh, and continue to, uh, to you know, to hold to the voice in the darkness. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And when we had built a great house, he came and stood before the high seat, and the house was lit as with fire. Now, he said, come forth any who still listen to the voice. There were some, but for fear they remained still and said naught. Then bow before me and acknowledge me, he said, and all bowed to the ground before him, saying, Thou art the one great, and we are thine. Thereupon he went up as in a great flame and smoke, and we were scorched by the heat. But suddenly he was gone, and it was darker than night, and we fled from the house. Ever after we went in great dread of the dark, but he seldom appeared among us again in fair form, and he brought few gifts. If, at great need, we dared to go to the house and pray to him to help us, we heard his voice and received his commands. But now he would always command us to do some deed, or to give him some gift, before he would listen to our prayer, and ever the deeds became worse, and the gifts harder to give up. The first voice we never heard again, save once. In the stillness of the night it spoke, saying, Ye have abjured me, and but ye remain mine. I gave you life, now it shall be shortened, and each of you in a little while shall come to me, to learn who is your Lord, the one ye worship, or I who made him. Oh, man. Okay. Um, yeah, Yana, I agree. It is almost like Morgoth is trying to make himself out to be the flame imperishable. Yes. I, again, talk about Mor uh, Morgoth's fantasy world, right? Uh, like he is the owner of the flame imperishable. Even his personal association with fire there, right? Like he is the flame in the darkness. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Big picture, of course, we can see Jennifer, just as you were saying, we can see him following that same strategy that was outlined uh, for what Morgoth followed with his peers, right, with the other spirits. Um, notice how having brought them to fear Eru and seek his protection and align themselves with him, he's now locking them down, um, not by continuing their sense of responsibility to him, but by corrupting them, right? By making them so that they can't go back, so that they are ashamed, right, to return. Um, he is... Uh, he makes them give him things. He makes them do things. Um, first, he makes them all bow to the ground and acknowledge him. Right. And then after that, he will help them, but only if they do deeds and ever the deeds became worse and the gifts harder to give up. And I totally agree, uh, David Erbach, that the gifts harder to give up is very creepy and worrisome. What exactly what deeds is he asking them to do? What gifts is he asking them to give? Um, how long is it before it comes to the point? where he's asking them uh, to sacrifice their children, for instance, right? Um, uh, and I, I mentioned that explicitly, of course, because there is a long tradition of that. I mean, the, um, uh, and I'm thinking, of course, here especially of uh, Old Testament traditions of the lands round about the Israelites, uh, where the demand of the of the pagan gods for the sacrifice of children was one of the common themes uh, that we see. So that's something that's that's around, right? Um, um, so anyway, um, but um, so he doesn't say he doesn't say what it is. But I can't help but think even in those directions, right? Um, but yeah, creepy and worrisome. I totally agree, David, about that. Um, and yeah, Brian, this is the, to me, one of the other most really interesting things, right? After, as Brian points out, once men have sworn allegiance to Morgoth, he doesn't seem that interested in them anymore. He only shows up occasionally and demands that they pray for, uh, uh, pray to him. Um, um, but he doesn't, he doesn't, yeah, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't need them. It's um, tempting to imagine, right, Morgoth wanting the worship of the men, 
right? You know, I was talking about Morgoth's own sort of fantasy world, right? In which he owns all the light and in which he has many different realms and, um, uh, you know, in which uh, he is the Lord of the void, right? In which he has or even is, in a sense, the flame imperishable. All those things are, you know, that's, that's Morgoth's fantasy life. But his fantasy life apparently does not include we're being worshipped as a god by the humans. He achieves it, right? But he seems to achieve it only, Brian, as a means to an end, right? It's not his end. It's not his goal. He doesn't care, actually, for his own sake, whether or not they worry him. Uh, not worry him. W- w- whether or not they worship him, right? Um, he's not worried about that. He uh, is just, it's just a means to an end. He wants to corrupt them. He wants to take them away from Eru. Right. Um, his goal is to estrange them from Eru. Um, and he accomplishes that goal. And having accomplished that goal, he's out. He's out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, as uh, Stephen Cover says, uh, Eru wants the men to stay away from Morgoth so that they would draw nearer to him and be with him. Morgoth wants the men to come nearer to him momentarily to keep them away from Eru. Um, yeah, 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 I think that's, I think that's right. Um, yeah, Josiah, I was actually thinking of that exact same passage too. Josiah was saying that the whole going up in flame thing, um, it's of course possible that that is part of his gig. Right, that that's part of like Morgoth's plan, that he's making a big exit that is supposed to terrify them uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, get them to continue to uh, fear him and uh, to continue their worship of him. Um, but Josiah is saying, is, is it conceivable that that is actually um, a judgment of er- from Eru to take him away from them? Um, you know, that... Um, and his comparison, the passage that he and I were both thinking of, was the passage at the end of Paradise Lost, um, when the demons turn into snakes. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that, too. I think in the end, it's probably Morgoth. Um, the thing the thing that I think that feels most Morgothian to me of this whole thing is the fact that they, the men themselves are scorched by the fire when he blows up. Um, that I think is, that seems to me a very Morgoth touch because this is the moment, right? Having achieved his goal of getting them to fear him and to worship him and to abjure Eru and cleave to him instead, having achieved that, he flips the switch. Give her a gift? No, no, no. Right? Now you have to propitiate me. That transition to fear Right. And so the scorching flame as this sign of like, now I'm going to give you a little glimpse. I'm going to give you a little peek of what's to come. I I want to begin to make you fear me um, and be aware of the fact that my fiery wrath is something to be feared. Right. Um, That feels to me like a Morgothian, um, a Morgothian manipulation rather than uh, a, 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 an Iluvatarian uh, uh, intervention on my part. But I, I mean, I'm not totally against that reading. I think it's possible. Um, but that's why I think the Morgoth version is, uh, is sort of more likely. Um, yeah. Now, Tomas, you're right that he is going to want the human troops for his army, but that I'm not a hundred percent sure that that occurs to him right here. Um, he doesn't seem to want that. In fact, we don't have any evidence from the Silmarillion tales themselves. We don't have any evidence from there that Morgoth ever actually recruits humans into his service, like to serve in his armies until after the humans start making a difference in Valerian after he realizes, whoa, okay, actually they're kind of capable I thought they were useless, but now I think they're kind of capable. Maybe I'm going to try to get my own army of men because he knows he's got resources there, right? Um, 
But again, I, d I don't see any evidence that he had men in his service, like armies in his service prior to that. I think he dis he discounts them. Um, and in particular, again, he's he's not going the right way about it. He seems to genuinely leave them behind. Um, he's not. We don't see anything in this story about him trying to mobilize them or trying to move them or trying to calling them to himself. Any hints or indications that he ever means for them to serve as his armies? Um, again, it's going to happen eventually, but I, I, I don't see any evidence from this story that that was part of Morgoth's original plan for humans. I think he just wanted to, Eru was doing something, he wanted to ruin it, and, and once he believed that he'd ruined it, he was like, I'm done. I'm going to stop wasting my time with these people now. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to continue it a little bit more. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to firm it up. Right. Because we've got to make sure that they um, the humans are all in. Right. They can't repent. And this, Matt, comes back to your question. Uh, Matt asks, how binding is that allegiance? I mean, once things go south, can't they just stop worshiping him and worship Eru again? Well, they could repent. That's very possible, I think. And that's why he does continue the investment, right? Doesn't hang out with them much anymore, but he does continue to corrupt them. He wants to do that final stage of that strategy that Jennifer was reminding us of before, which is that he, um, he wants to bring them to a point where they can't turn back anymore, right? Where they're too ashamed to turn back, where they are so... That so thoroughly invested in corruption that they just they can't they're you know they they would face punishment if they came back right there's you know they're too guilty to come back anymore to go back to Eru anymore um, and so we can see him continuing that perpetuating that right um, and. Uh, so he's, he's st he remains invested to that. But again, that doesn't seem to me like, and now I'm shifting into plan B, right? Where I build an army worthy of Morgoth, right? That doesn't seem to be his plan. Instead, this is just like, this is the, um, this is sealing the deal, right? I've, uh, I've, 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 I've done the thing, but now I've got some follow-up to do to make sure that this doesn't, you know, we don't get all like grace and redemption, you know, while my back is turned here. Um, yeah. And Francis, they do seem like they become an afterthought to him. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Yana, I, I, Yana is thinking that burning him up doesn't seem to be quite Eru's style. Um, I, I think I agree with that too. It doesn't feel, it's not quite Eru's idiom, I think to make him burst into a ball of flames like that. Whereas ball of flame seems a little bit more Morgoth's idiom to me. I think that that also does kind of sway me um, uh, there a little bit as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There isn't any, David, you're right that the voice doesn't give an indication of the heritability of guilt, like original sin, right? Um, it doesn't say anything about future generations. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. I agree that that is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen is wondering how much of their bowing and worshiping him is an oath. Um, that, uh, you know, that is kind of binding on them. I think it's binding. I mean, do I think that they can't repent? No, I think that they could repent. I think that, the, again, the fact that he follows up with them in the way that he does um, to make them more and more guilty and therefore more and more uh, to cre put more and more obstacles between them and repentance, right? Between them and going back to Eru. Um that suggests to me that repentance was possible, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, Jocelyn. That's exactly it. Um, 
the shame of their actions. Like if they, if they become, you know, uh, like if they're like committing cannibalism or child sacrifice or raping their daughters or who knows what Morgoth is trying to push them towards doing. Right. But whatever they do, whatever, you know, the more he can get them to do, you know, to be doing, um, as you say, Jocelyn, uh, something really yucky like that, um, then yeah, it absolutely would keep them away from returning. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, as Josiah says, Morgoth is the archetypal abuser. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a, uh, there's a lot to be, uh, there's a lot to be said about that parallel. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Um, Brian says, in a way, making men mortal makes redemption more possible over time, since new generations of men did not actually commit the same terrible acts and have a choice. Um, yes, yes. If that first generation of men, which, you know, s d bowed down before him and, and committed the terrible acts, um, if they stick around for a really long time, right, then they um, uh, they are then it would kind of make the perpetuation of that whole state of things easier, I think. Um, uh, so, yeah, it makes me think of... Um, what was that? Um, oh, I think, Josiah, I think it was you who was quoting this a while back. I've lost it where you quoted it. But that famous quote from Tolkien's letters, you know, which of God's punishments uh, are not also gifts? Um and I think that in mortality, um, Brian, there is a way that in which we can see that, right? There's a certain um, there's a certain way in which introducing mortality also kind of quarantines this evil in time, right? Uh, in a sense. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, Cecilia is remembering... Uh, in the Genesis story, God's intervention to prevent Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of life after they'd eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. Then our terror of the dark was increased, for we believed that the voice was of the darkness behind the stars. Can I just say that phrase, the darkness behind the stars? is really a kind of terrifying phrase. Um, the characterization of that darkness is not... On the one hand, it's remote, it's distant, but it's also lurking, right? I, just, I find that phrase really creepy. Uh, was of the darkness behind the stars, and some of us began to die in horror and anguish, fearing to go out into the dark. Then we called on our master to save us from death, and he did not answer. But when we went to the house and all bowed down there, at last he came, great and majestic, but his face was cruel and proud. Now ye are mine and must do my will, he said. I do not trouble that some of you die and go to appease the hunger of the dark, for otherwise there would soon be too many of you crawling like lice on the earth. See, that doesn't sound like somebody who's trying to build a huge army. But if ye do not do my will, ye will feel my anger, and ye will die sooner, for I will slay you. Thereafter we were grievously afflicted by, afflicted by weariness and hunger and sickness, and the earth and all things in it were turned against us. Fire and water rebelled against us. Birds and beasts shunned us, or if they were strong, they assailed us. Plants gave us poison, and we feared the shadows under the trees." Now they are gaining a different kind of wisdom about the world, right? Yeah, Josiah is recalling, of course, how that phrase, uh, the darkness behind the stars, is a near direct quote from Gollum's riddle. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and yes, uh, Giant 98 and uh, 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 Aslan's Compass before in uh, the Twitch chat are, of course, remembering Tom Bombadil's comment about remembering the dark under the stars when it was fearless. Yeah. Yeah. Before the Dark Lord came from the outside. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, again, I think my suspicion is that the scorn that Morgoth is showing towards the humans here is genuine. Um, I think that he genuinely uh, looks at them like lice crawling on the earth, um, infesting the earth. Um, he doesn't want them to be there to be too many of them. Um, now, it's just all about he doesn't care about their reverence. He just wants them to fear him. Um, but they fear the dark even more. Right. Um, and what an amazing thing. I think, um, Josiah, back to your point about the archetypal abuser. Right. Think about the way that he is the state he's brought them to. Right. Where they fear him, but they fear the darkness more. And now he has brought them to now where he doesn't even have to do anything nice to them. Right. If all he does is not kill them. Right. Allow them to not go into the dark sooner. Right. Just give them a little bit of extra time before going off into the dark and you'll be grateful for that. Right. I mean, that's that's where where he's brought things. Right. If if I just uh, I want you to be grateful just that I haven't gone out of my way to stomp on you. Um, that's what you should be grateful and worshipful to me for. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Brian asks a really interesting question. Is the way the earth and its creatures turn against men a punishment from Morgoth or from Eru? It seems it could be either. <sighs> both see i think and honestly to be honest this has always been my reading of genesis 3 as well um i think it's less about a punishment or a curse laid upon them by a luvatar and more a question of this is the con this, this is the consequence of their actions right and even in genesis 3 um god doesn't say to adam and eve now I am going to make this happen to you. I am going to make... Uh, he just says, this is how it's going to be now, right? FYI, this is uh, like spoilers, but here's what's going to... Here's what things are going to be like now, right? Um, you know, does it mean it's not like God's choice? Of course, it's, it is God's choice, right? But again, it's... Even there, it's not a clear cut. I am I am afflicting you with this thing now, with this punishment now, Um this is how things are going to be. And that's that's how that paragraph sounds here very much to me. Um, the earth and all, and all things in it were turned against us. Fire and water rebelled against us. Birds and beasts shunned us, or if they were strong, they assailed us. They're grievously afflicted by weariness, hunger, and sickness. Um, this is this is what life is like in a world in which they turn have turned against Eru. They are no longer in harmony with Eru's music. Right. They have rejected everything about it. What are they experiencing? They're experiencing discord. Right. This is what discord is like. If you choose not to go with the harmonies that Eru has established in the world, guess what the result is? Disharmony. Right. Disharmony between you and the world. Is that a punishment? Yeah. In a sense. Was the discord a punishment? Um you know, Melkor didn't exactly create discord. He created his own theme. And that theme was in discord with Iluvatar's theme. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, they're experiencing discord here. This is uh, uh, this is the human level version, the human experience version um, of the turbulence and turmoil swirling around the seat of Eru in the Ainulindale. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Arthur says, we've heard about the dark, uh, and now about time. Uh, are we going to be hearing references to fish or teeth soon? Hey man, Gollum's riddles, um, foreshadow many things. There is uh deep wisdom, uh, in the riddle 
contest between uh, Bilbo and Gollum. I honestly think it's, I don't think it is true that when Gollum wrote the, when Gollum wrote the Hobbit, when Tolkien wrote the Hobbit and he was thinking about Gollum's riddles and Bilbo's riddles, I don't think that when Tolkien wrote the Hobbit, he was, you know, embedding in these riddles in the Hobbit all of this like theological stuff that was going to uh, that he was planning, you know, f- to develop uh, as his world went along. I don't think that's the situation at all. Um, I think that in those riddles, he sort of planted the seeds. Right. Or, or even to say that in those riddles, we can see the seeds that were already planted in Tolkien's mind, right? Ways in which he was already thinking about things, which take a long time to come out explicitly, but we do eventually see uh, see them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys are all teasing me for misspeaking and saying that Gollum wrote The Hobbit. Um, I think that would be a, kind of interesting, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be kind of interesting? I mean, we got Bilbo's version of the story. Wouldn't Gollum's version of the story be kind of interesting? Yeah. Um, <laughs> David R. Fox says, yeah, the nasty little hobbit, <laughs> colon, here to steal my precious and go again to his nasty little hole. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, um, it would be, um, yeah, uh, it would be interesting. It would be interesting. Um, I think actually even better though, or more fun to read anyway would be a version of The Hobbit with the original text and Gollum's commentary, like Gollum's marginal commentary on The Hobbit is, I think, what would be even better than a full narrative. Um, That would be way better. Way better. Boy, that should exist, shouldn't it? Maybe an audio commentary. Yeah, that would be even better. Love it. Okay, sorry. Um, that was a that was a fortuitous misspeaking. What a fun idea that is. Yeah, um, yeah, Brandon, you're right. I'm sure Trixie false would uh, <laughs> would would occur many times at, at different points uh, in the uh, in the margins. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. If ever I meet Andy Serkis, I'll talk to him about it. <laughs> if ever I meet him, I'll definitely I'll, I'll definitely bring it up because it's a good idea. Um, so many possibilities. The Gollum commentary, the Gandalf commentary, um, the Bomber commentary. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, The Legolas commentary. That would be interesting. So many possibilities. Yeah. Yep. Um, Yeah. Yeah. The Thrush commentary. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Roox commentary. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, several people are thinking about a thinking fox commentary, right? On uh, on on the Lord of the Rings. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so many possibilities. Yeah, exactly, David. You're right. We do have a snippet of the thinking fox commentary in the Fellowship of the Ring, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, Devorah, you're right. I don't think Tom Bombadil would be bothered uh, to do a commentary, right? Um, uh, <laughs> right? He would just be like a note at the end of the chapter, right? Um, uh, I meant to be writing a commentary, but I was too busy singing. Yeah, that would be it. Um, 
Anyway, okay, sorry. Back to <laughs> this text, however. Um, okay, let's go on. Let's keep going. We're almost there. Almost to the end of this tale. Then there arose some among us who said openly in their despair, Now we know at last who lied and who desired to devour us. Not the first voice. It is the master that we have taken who is darkness. And he did not come forth from it as he said, but he dwells in it. We will serve him no longer. He is our enemy. Then in fear, lest, we should, lest he should hear them and punish us all, we slew them if we could. And those that fled we hunted. And if any were caught, our masters, his friends, commanded that they should be taken to the house and there done to death by fire. That pleased him greatly, his friend said. And indeed, for a while, it seemed that our afflictions were lightened. Again, notice the whole circle of abuse thing going on here still. But it is told that there were a few that escaped us and went away into far countries, fleeing from the shadow. Yet they did not escape from the anger of the voice. For they had built the house and bowed down in it, and they came at last to the land's end and the shore of the impassable water, and behold, the enemy was there before them. That is such a creepy ending to the story. And behold, the enemy was there before them. Oh, man. Um... And yes, you're right, David, about the... David Attlee, about the parallels to the... Uh, uh, to Numenor, right? Um, uh, notice again how the, we can see the payoff, we can see the effect of the shame, uh, the shame and the guilt that he has created, and the fear, right? The shame, the guilt, and the fear, which all now work together to say anyone who wants to repent, right? Anybody who wants to rebel, anyone who's willing to to say, which is fairly clear now, right? Who lied and who desired to devour us, Um we have to we have to shut them up right the heck now right says everybody else um and uh and of course the more they do this the more they continue now um the cycle is per self perpetuating right absolutely um yeah um so who is telling this story david who the us is this is the story from the people of Marek. This is Adonel's story. So Andreth said that Adonel from the people of Marek had this story that she told. Um, so the us is really interesting, though, isn't it? It is a collective us. Um, the narrator of this story identifies with it, right? Um, connects herself to the people who do the horrible deeds she doesn't distance herself from it, right? This is not a story of superiority. This is not a story of those horrible, primitive people who did these terrible things. But fortunately, we left, right? And we've uh, we've we've come away from that. It's um, it's very different, right? Um, this is a story about us. We are the guilty ones. We, the peoples, are the are the, the guilty ones. And Josiah, yeah, which Josiah was just pointing, uh, uh, pointing, uh, to that, um, to that thing as well there. Um, yeah, good. Right. And, uh, giant 98 was pointing back to the fact that this is said to be a Numenorean tradition again, like by definition, anything passed down through human tradition and surviving is, is a Numenorean tradition, um, had to go through Numenor. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, good. Okay. Some other reflections on this. And here's where we're going to begin glancing ahead towards the uh, traditions, tra uh, the myths transformed. Query. Is it not right to make Andreth refuse to discuss any traditions or legends of the fall? Already it is, if inevitably, too like a parody of Christianity. Any legend of the fall would make it completely so. This is Tolkien's notes, right? Um, too like a parody of Christianity. Originally, instead of refusal to talk of it, Andreth was made under pressure to say something of this sort. It is said that Melkor looked fair in ancient days, and that when he had gained men's love, he blasphemed Eru, denying his existence and claiming that he was the Lord, and men assented and took him as Lord and God. Thereupon, say some, 
Our spirits, having denied their own true nature, at once became darkened and weakened, and through this weakness they lost the mastery of their bodies, which fell into unhealth. Others say that Eru himself spoke in wrath, saying, If the darkness be your god, little shall ye have here of light. Later changed to, On earth ye shall have little light, and shall leave it soon, and come before me to learn who lieth, your god or I who made him. And these are the most afraid of death. Um, okay, so let me talk about this in reverse. First, let's talk about this other short version that he was kind of thinking about. Um, we can see, of course, how in this short version we don't get anything like the subtlety of Morgoth's approach. This just describes the really simple approach, where Morgoth comes to them and says, Hi, I'm really impressive, aren't I? I'm actually your god, not the one that you haven't seen. And they're like, okay, you're our god. And then he's like, great, thanks, now you're cursed. So I, I, it's, it, it's a much simpler trajectory here. It makes sense, right? It holds together, but it's much simpler. So um, we can see how the telling of the full narrative greatly enriched uh, his conception of that dynamic. But um, that last, those last lines, the, the words of Eru to them, if the darkness be your God, little shall ye have here of light. On earth ye shall have little light. That is, he's emphasizing the here, right? It, it's not changing the statement, but it changes the emphasis. Here on earth ye shall have little light. You're going to live in darkness. You're going to live in suffering. Why? Because that's what you've chosen, right? If you choose the darkness to be your God, then guess what? Darkness ye shall have, right? But you will leave it soon. And when you leave the darkness behind, when you leave this world full of darkness for you behind, and you will do it soon, because I'm going to shorten your lifespan, you will come before me and learn who lieth, your God or I who made him. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, can Melkor change the destiny of men? No. Finrod doesn't believe it, and neither do I. What is the destiny of men? The destiny of men is to leave Earth and come to Eru. The one thing that is clear and consistent throughout this whole Athrabeth tradition uh, is that there is a different and more direct relationship between Iluvatar and humans. This is why the Valar don't pay attention to the humans. Eru has a different plan with them, and Eru uh, interacts with them directly. And their destiny is to come, is to leave Arda behind and come before him. And the fact that they have turned away from him and chosen to worship the darkness instead doesn't change that. It just changes the situation when they come before him, right? Um, and these are the most afraid of death. Yeah. Um, and that's really fascinating, right? They're afraid of death because they're afraid of the dark. To them, to die means to go off into the dark, and we saw that in the tale of Adonel as well. And the darkness Morgoth has invested with fear. But their turning to Morgoth itself also is the source of their fear because death. what death really means is coming before the voice, standing before the one whose voice they turned away from. Um, and that's why they fear it. So that, you know, the clinging to life that we see humans doing again and again and again. Uh, again, think about how this recontextualizes a lot of the earlier myths. Um, the story of Numenor, the story of the ringwraiths themselves, right? Um, Elves don't want to let Arda go. Elves seek to preserve and hold on to things in Arda. 
humans do too, but not for the same reason, right? Um, instead, he makes them... Um, he suggests that one of the reasons they are clinging to Arda is that they fear what comes next. Uh, that it is their very guilt and shame which contributes to their desire for immortality, or rather, to their fear of death. Um, but let me... Um, let's see, hang on. So Devorah says, does the these or the others who are attributing this saying to... Okay, and these... Hang on a second. Devor, I'm not sure I'm following your question. Um, okay, we've got others say that Eru himself spoke, and these are the most afraid... All right, okay. Yes. Yes, Devorah. Those who say that Eru himself spoke that in wrath are the ones who are most afraid of death. Yes. Yes. Um, all people, all humans are afraid of death because they're all afraid of the darkness. They have learned the fear of the darkness from Melkor. But who is most afraid of death? Those who also know about Eru. Again, Numenor, right? Numenor. Um, yep, yep. Okay. Um, back to the first part, which is Tolkien thinking to himself about the Athrobeth. Is it not right to make Andreth refuse to discuss any traditions or legends of the fall? That is, would it be better not to tell this story at all? Would, wouldn't that be a better choice? Wouldn't that perhaps be a better choice? Already, it is, if inevitably, too like a parody of Christianity. Any legend of the fall would make it completely so. Um... Now, by parody of Christianity, what Tolkien means, I believe, is he has resisted telling mythic stories which are just rehashing the Bible, essentially. He hasn't done that. Um, he has made his mythology consistent, and we have seen over the course of Morgoth's Ring him working very hard to make his mythology still mythologically powerful, but consistent with Christianity, theologically and philosophically consistent uh, with Christianity. Um, but here, he's straight up against it, right? How did men fall? Notice how he says... It's inevitably too like a parody of Christianity. And by it, the it there, already it is too like a parody of Christianity. The it, I think, is the Athrobeth. The Athrobeth is too like a parody of Christianity. Because when he is talking about these things, these questions of human sin, the connection between human sin and human mortality, the ultimate destiny of the souls of humanity and the few, the like redemptive God's redemptive plan for the world. He's addressed all four of those things during the Athrobeth. And in doing, in addressing those things, those, his answer to those things, right? The way he addresses those things are in line with Christian, are expressing Christian ideas. He has already decided, right? He's already committed to the idea that his world is consistent with Christianity in this way. And so the closer he gets to asking the questions, the very questions that are most explicitly answered in the Bible, the more his mythology becomes a mere retelling of biblical stories, of biblical doctrine. And that, I think, is what he means by saying a parody of Christianity. There's no question that the tale of Adonel is just, is like, and I think he's using the word parody kind of self-deprecatingly, but there's no question the tale of Adonel is like another version of the story of Adam and Eve, 
right? I mean, the parallels are very close. Um, and, uh, and but it's not the same, but it's very close. So it's, it's like a parody, right? It's not a mockery. He's not saying, you know, he's not, he's not distancing his text from Christianity at all. He's saying like, I'm, I'm just, I'm redoing the Bible here basically. And this is why he's thinking maybe, um, Maybe it would be better. Maybe it's best just not to do this at all, not to talk about this at all. Um, and yet, David, exactly, I don't think he's using the word parody with the suggestion of satire. Um, but when you ask, is Tolkien worried that the Athrobeth might be disrespectful or sinful for being so close to Christianity but not different? Y- y- um, yes, exactly. I think that that's what he thinks is a possibility. Um there's nothing, he does not think that there is anything wrong spiritually, as far as his own soul is concerned, right? With writing an alternative mythology, you know, writing the stories of the elves, writing the stories of the Valar, talking about all that stuff, like, it's fine. He doesn't have any problems with that. But I'm going to, what, bring Genesis 3 up to date? Like, yeah, okay, that's a little harder now. Right. That's a little um, that's a little trickier. Uh, And again, it's not he's not ascribing to himself a a satirical intention. But I do think that he uses that word slightingly, self-deprecatingly in that way. That it's going to at the at the worst, it might sound like a parody. Right. Um, Yeah. Bruce and Lewis did kind of already do it. Right. And it made Tolkien uncomfortable when Lewis did it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Exactly. Here's the thing that I want to point to here, though. Big, like, backing up from this for a second. The word inevitable, or inevitably, here. Already it is, if inevitably too like a parody of Christianity. Inevitably. Why is it inevitable? Why is it inevitable that the Athrobeth should sound to him too like a parody of Christianity? Answer. Because it's the same. Because he's talking about, because the God in his story is the same God as in the Bible. Because the world in his story is our world. Because humans in his story, in his sub-created world, are humans from our world. He is operating still. And this is something that goes back to the very beginning, right? As we've talked about many times. He was originally telling stories of our world, of his country, right? Of England in particular, but of our world in general. That has never been, for all of his talk about subcreation, for all of his willing to be a lover of nature and not her slave, creating a secondary world which is separate from the primary world and all of these things, there is one fundamental restriction. There is one frame that he is not willing to break, and it's that one. He is not willing to say the world of my story is this. It's just a made up world. It's not our world. He won't do it. He won't. Um, and that is what is going to lead to so many problems in Myths Transformed. Um, I have said before that I disagree with him strongly with myths transformed. I talked about this some when we were back talking about the flat earth, uh, uh, um, not a Calabeth, um, I know Lindale. Um, this is the, and that's the thing that I disagree with. Um, there is one step he has. He's no longer writing mythology for England He's only in the vaguest way 
actually trying to suggest that the history of his world, that his world is happening in the, you know, the distant prehistory of our world and that, you know, uh, Middle Earth is Europe, essentially, geographically speaking and all that kind of thing. Um, He's given over on most of that, kind of, sort of. But at the deepest level, he refuses to let that go. He won't just say, my stories take part in an imaginary sub-creation which is not our world. He won't do it. He won't do it. And we, see, we can see that here in, a, in the word inevitably. Um, he is bound because he, A, continues the connection between his stories and his myths between his stories and myths and our world, and also is a person of profound faith, uh, you know, believes very strongly in what Christianity teaches about who God is and, you know, how God should be related to humanity and all these things. Because of these things, uh, because of of those two facts, it is inevitable. It is made inevitable by those two things. Um, Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure, however, that I agree with Christopher's implications in Christopher's commentary. So in Christopher's commentary on this, he quotes the letter to Milton Waldman. That's the first passage. It's from that letter to, to Milton Waldman. Um, The one in which, okay, I'll just read it. So proceeding, the elves have a fall before their history can become storial. The first fall of man, for reasons explained, nowhere appears. Men do not come on stage until all that is long past, and there is only a rumor that for a while they fell under the domination of the enemy and that some repented. So this is Christopher's commentary now. And he quotes, the first fall of man, for reasons explained, nowhere appears. What were those reasons? Then what were the reasons that he explained? My father must have been referring to the beginning of this letter, where he wrote of the Arthurian legend that it is involved in and explicitly contains the Christian religion, and went on, For reasons which I will not elaborate, that seems to me fatal. Myth and fairy story must, as all art, reflect and contain in solution elements of moral and religious truth, or error, but not explicit not in the known form of the primary world. Okay. Um, So Christopher is suggesting here in his discussion of the Milton Waldman letter, he's basically saying this is why dad was uncomfortable, right? Um, His father's letter to Milton Waldman, right? Christopher's father's letter to Milton Waldman lays out, says explicitly, I'm not going to include the story of the fall of man, right? Because reasons, for reasons I explained. And I think that Christopher is right to say that what he's alluding back to is his reference in the beginning of the letter that says explicit inclusion of religious truth in the known form of the primary real world is fatal to myth and fairy story. And this is why he thinks that the Arthurian legend um, falls. It fails. The Arthurian legend is great, but it fails. And in one of the reasons that it fails is that there is too much Christianity. Christianity is explicitly a part of the Arthurian legend, and so it fails as myth. Um, now, Okay, here's where I disagree. I think I disagree with Christopher. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding Christopher, but um, I think this is a slight misapplication of that quote about religious truth not being explicit. Um Okay, it's tricky. 
I'll try to do this. When Tolkien says there at the very end there, um, myth and fairy story must reflect and contain in solution elements of moral and spirit and, and religious truth or error, but it shouldn't be explicit in the known form of the primary real world. What he's saying there, therefore, you can't have a, a myth, you can't write a myth or a fairy tale about Christianity. If you have, like Arthurian, like the Arthurian legend does, if you have churches and people going to mass and worship and prayers and saints and all of those, all of that stuff, right? If you include those things, the real religion in the fairy story, in the myth, that's fatal to the myth. That's what the Arthurian story does that he's, that he's objecting about, right? You can, because the Christian story not only is an incidental part, it's not just part because it's not just part of the background of the Arthurian story. It becomes a major theme of the Arthurian story in the Grail stories in particular, right? And this is where he thinks that the Arthurian legends fail as myth, fail as fairy story um, because they make that real primary world religious truth and moral truth part of their story. Now, does that mean... Now, I agree with Christopher that this is the passage that Tolkien is referring back to when he says, the, fall, the first fall of man for reasons explained nowhere appears. Yes, I believe he is referring to that passage. Um, but here's the thing. At that point, at the time at which he wrote the letter to Milton Waldman, that is in the early 50s, what was it, 1951? I'm trying to remember the date of that, 1950. Somebody tell me that it's early 50s. It's before, of course, the publication of The Lord of the Rings, because it was a letter written to try to convince uh, Milton Waldman to publish The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion altogether. Um but, um, uh, yes, somebody remind me of the date. I think it was 51 is what I want to say off the top of my head, but it might be, it might be a couple years later than that. Um, but anyway, um, at that time, Tolkien hadn't done any of this. All of Morgoth's ring, right? All of this Morgoth's ring material still lay in front of him. If at that time, if at the time of the writing of the Lord of the Rings, he had included a version of the first fall of man, what would he have, he wouldn't have had anything, right? All that he would have been doing is including Genesis 3, essentially. What he's saying here, I think, is the first fall of man, the, the shadow that lies upon the hearts of the Adain when they come across the mountains into Beleriand is the Garden of Eden. Right. Because, again, this is the same. This is the same world. Right. It is, in fact, Genesis three, which is lying. On, so if he were to tell the story of the first fall of man, he would just be. Bringing in the known form of the religion from the primary real world, he would just be talking about Adam and Eve. So he's like, obviously not going to talk about Adam and Eve in these stories for reasons that I explained about how you don't want to make it explicit in the, in the known form of the primary real world. Um, it is 51. I was right. Excellent. Okay. Um, but 10 years later or seven, eight years later, he's in a different place, right? The tale of Adonel, it comes close to explicit, in the known form of the real primary, primary real world, but it's not, it's not that it's, he has now taken it. He has been revising his myths. He has been developing his myths so that now his myths do include a version of the first fall of man, which is not merely an explicit reference to the, to the garden, of, but it is a parody Right, it is a very close parallel to it, such that it might sound like a parody of it, uh, would be, I think, his concern. Um, but, but it isn't. It isn't just alluding to Adam and Eve. 
Um, so this is where I kind of disagree with Christopher. I don't think that he's just reversed himself here. I think that he is that what he has done in the Athrobath certainly, and even in the Tale of Adonel, is still consistent with the principles that he laid down to Milton Waldman in these letters. Um, this is where I think Christopher seems to suggest that he's um, uh, his impulse not to do this is is the right one, right, and is in keeping with um, uh, with the earlier stuff. And by the way. I think this is why Christopher didn't include it. Tolkien explicitly said that the Athrobeth was supposed to be an appendix to the Silmarillion, right? He intended it to be an appendix to the Silmarillion. Christopher chose not to include it as an appendix to the Silmarillion when he could have done so. And he didn't do that. Why didn't he do it? I believe that Christopher didn't do it because he believes that it is inconsistent with Tolkien's other ideas that it it involves Tolkien in a fundamental change of direction in his mythology in his approach to mythology i disagree with christopher there i don't think it is inconsistent with that at all um uh i'm not saying that i think you know i do think that the closeness between the closeness of the parallel between the tale of adonel and genesis 3 does make that story seem a little bit less Tolkien-like in some ways, right? Um, the mythology that Tolkien, the myth that Tolkien is writing in writing the tale of Adonel does not seem to me as, it doesn't feel the same, it doesn't taste the same as Tolkien's other myths. And I think it's because it is a very direct parallel, because of that whole parody of Christianity dynamic that he's pointing to there. Um but, um, uh, but yeah, I don't, um, I don't agree with Christopher that it's inconsistent. Um, and what I would have said, what I would have said, not that he would have cared, but what I would have said to Tolkien would be, no, I think it's okay. I, I, I hear you. I see your concerns, but I, I think it's fine. <laughs> I think it's, I, I, I think it, uh, it doesn't cross that line to me. Um, but there's no question that it's, um, uh, it's going in that direction, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Let's keep going a little bit. We should at least start talking about Manway and Eru's conversation. Manway spoke to Eru. And of course, what is Manway talking to Eru about? Obviously, the only issue anybody would take up directly with Eru, right? The only issue that has happened in the history of the world sufficiently important to make Manway go back for a one-on-one -on -one con consult with Eru, and that is, of course, Finway and Muriel's divorce, <laughs> right? Everybody knows that's the most important thing that's ever happened. Um, anyway... Manway spoke to Eru, saying, Behold, an evil appears in Arda that we did not look for. The firstborn children, whom thou madest immortal, suffer now severance of spirit and body. Many of the Fear of the elves in Middle-earth are now houseless, and even in Amon there is one. The houseless we summon to Amon to keep them from the darkness, and all who hear our voice abide here in waiting. What further is to be done? Is there no means by which their lives may be renewed? to follow the courses which thou hast designed? And what of the bereaved who mourn those who have gone? Uh, Ero, I want to talk about this death situation, right? The, we've got dead elves on our hands and we don't know what to do about it. This seems like a pretty big problem. Ero answered, Let the houseless be rehoused. Manwe asked, How shall this be done? Ero answered, Let the body that was destroyed be remade. Or let the naked Fea be reborn as a child. Manwe said, Is it thy will that we should attempt these things? For we fear to meddle with thy children. And then Eru makes with a snark. Have I not given to the Valar the rule of Arda, and power over all the substance thereof, to shape it at their will, under my will? Ye have not been backward in these things. 
As for my firstborn, have ye not removed great numbers of them to Ammon from the Middle Earth in which I set them? Kind of late in the day for you to be worrying about meddling with my children, Manway, right? That ship has sailed. I just love that answer. That is extremely gentle, right? Extremely gentle rebuke. I hear it as a little bit of a rebuke uh, from Arrow to Manway here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, the big issue, the big issue that Christopher is focusing on here in giving us this text is the question of the rebirth of the elves. The, that is the mechanism of the rehousing of elvish fear. Um, it, of course, goes back to the very beginning, the original, and we've talked about this before, but brief recap from the very beginning, elves were reborn. They were, uh, they were reincarnated in the bodies of children born to their descendants, right? So from the beginning, we had the whole slightly comical elvish situation of they give birth to a child and find that it's grandpa. Right. That's that's how it always was from the beginning. Tolkien seemed to pull back from that a little bit, but he re-upped on that during the um, the custom, laws and customs among the Eldar time. Right. We saw that earlier in this work that he was working out in great detail how that could be. Right. How um, an elf could have and retain memories of its childhood before it recovered memories of its previous life uh, and how that all can work. Um, uh, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Josiah says, uh, in response to my saying that that ship has sailed, he said it's, the, the island has sailed, technically. Yeah, true enough, true enough. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, uh, so, but now Tolkien seems to be having philosophical doubts about this again. And as Christopher has pointed out, the problem is, uh, lies primarily with the way in which the second parents are getting a little gypped, right? Um, but um, how shall we this be done? So Eru still says there are two possibilities, right? Let the body that was destroyed be remade. Let the naked fair be reborn as a child. Now, keep in mind, he has said recently in the post-Lord of the Rings period, he has re-emphasized it is only through birth that rebirth is possible. For an elf to come back to its form means to be reborn. They can only do that through the womb. Why? Because the womb is the only only arrow through the process of conception can join a fea and a roa. Right? That's, that is, the, the womb is the fea and roa connecting machine. Like that's that's how it works. Um, that's where it happens. That's the only way that it happens. Uh, so therefore, all elves who are going to get bodies again have to do it the old-fashioned biological way. That again, so Tolkien had re-emphasized that recently. Now we see him beginning to pull back from it. That it's possible for the body that was destroyed to be remade. Let's reassemble the original kit. But it's still possible. To let the naked fair be reborn as a child. Right? Manway answered, This we have done for fear of Melkor. Uh, that is, bringing them over to Amon, right? We thought it was a good idea, actually. Um, and with good intent, though not without misgiving. But to use our power upon the flesh that thou hast designed to house the spirits of thy children, this seems a matter beyond our authority, even were it not beyond our skill. Eru said, I give you authority. The skill ye have already, if ye will take heed. Look, and ye shall find that each spirit of my children retaineth in itself the full imprint and memory of its former house. And in its nakedness it is open to you, so that ye may clearly perceive all that is in it. After this imprint ye may make for it again such a house in all particulars as it had ere evil befell it. Thus ye may send it back to the lands of the living. Then Manwe asked further, O Iluvatar, hast thou not spoken also of rebirth? Is that too within our power and authority? Eru answered, It shall be within your authority, but it is not in your power. Those whom ye judge fit to be reborn, if they desire it and understand clearly what they incur, 
ye shall surrender to me, and I will consider them. Okay. Um, now, Manway's objection, concerned, right, um, is very understandable, right? Yes, they have dominion over the world, but the children of Iluvatar are called the children of Iluvatar for a reason, right? And so, um, since Iluvatar gives them their bodies in the first place, right? Their bodies are designed by Iluvatar, and he directly intervened in the making of the children, and they didn't, they, the Valar, didn't have a part in that. So, for him to say, like, well, you pretty much see how it's done, right? Now you try. Um, like, for them to make construct bodies for the children of Iluvatar would seem to be, well, then they're not going to be the children of Iluvatar anymore. They're going to be the children of the Valar, right? Um, you know, Manu is kind of like, didn't you have a talk with Aule about this? <laughs> right? That hasn't happened yet. Um, but again, right, we, we can see there's, 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 this, there's this issue. Um, but anyway, notice the really clever solution to this problem. The clever solution is, no, don't worry. You're not just making up a new body for them based on your own model. You're not upgrading the work of Iluvatar. You're repli excuse me, you're replicating it. I've given you the power to replicate it because my children, the children of Iluvatar, retain the imprint, right? The blueprints are right there. Um, they have the whole... All you got to do is follow the recipe. Their souls have the recipes for their bodies retained in them. And that, I think, is a really clever solution. So the um, Valar are mechanically involved, right? They're mechanically involved in the reassembly process. But they just they just have to follow the directions. It's still Iluvatar's directions. And so, in fact, what it begins to look like is a recapitulation of the music, right? Where... Iluvatar declares the themes and they perform the themes, right? Um, I love that recapitulation element um, of, uh, of this thing, right? Um, or they can just refer the problem directly to God, right? Um, we'll turf this Fea directly to Eru. We give it our permission, but, um, you know, it's up to you. Have him reborn if you want to have him reborn. A hastily written manuscript on slips on small slips of paper entitled Reincarnation of Elves seems to show my father's reflections on the subject between the abandonment of the converse of Manwe and Eru and the commentary on the Athrobeth. Uh, remember, his argument is that the commentary on the Athrobeth is written after this stuff. So there's a delay between the writing of the Athrobeth and the writing of the commentary. In this discussion, he referred in pencil Sorry, he referred in rapid and elliptical expression to the difficulties at every level, including practical and psychological, in the idea of the reincarnation of the Fea as the newborn child of second parents, who, as it grows up, recaptures the memory of its previous life. That was, that was the latest idea. The most fatal objection being, as he says, that it contradicts the fundamental notion that the Hfea and the Hroa were each fitted to the other. Since Hroar have a physical descent, the body of rebirth, having different parents, must be different. And this must be a condition of pain to the reborn Fea. Yes, as he has continued, he doubled back down on the rebirth solution um, because he wanted, he was emphasizing that the Fea only comes from Eru, like the children of Iluvatar are from Eru, right? The very problem that Manwe is voicing was the thing that led him to say, rebirth, man, rebirth is the only possible mechanism. But now that he's done even more thinking about the nature of the Fea and the Hroa and their connection, he's now saying, no way, it's not possible. It can't happen. Um, it violates the direct relationship between the Fea and the Hroa. Because um, the Hroa, the second Hroa has to be different. It has to. The reborn Hroa is descended from different parents. It's going to be different. But the Hroa, the, and that means that there's going to be an, um, an ill suiting between. Um, it will not be, f the, the, the fail will not f perfectly fit 
within its new Croa. He was here abandoning and for good the long-rooted conception of rebirth as the mode by which the elves might return to incarnate life. From his scrutiny of the mythical idea, questioning its validity in terms he had adopted, it had come to seem to him a serious flaw in the metaphysic of elvish existence. But, he said, it was a dilemma, for the reincarnation of the elves seems an essential element in the tales. The only solution, he decided in this discussion, was the idea of remaking an identical form, the Hroa of the Dead, in the manner declared by Eru in the converse of Menwe and Eru. The Thea retains a memory, an imprint, of its Hroa, its former house, so powerful and precise that the reconstruction of an identical body can proceed from it. Um, notice here Tolkien saying explicitly what we have been looking at already throughout Morgoth's Ring. Right, this contradiction or tension, at least, between metaphysics, right, uh, between working out the philosophical ideas, between reconciling the Silmarillion and and the Lord of the Rings, and mythology, right, when theology and myth are in conflict, he's really torn. It is fascinating to me that Tolkien believed that the reincarnation of elves in the bodies of children, that that seemed to him an essential element in the tales. I can't see it myself. I can't see it. I can't think of any of the stories that seem essentially connected to that idea. It almost never even comes up in the stories. There's no revision necessary. I mean, of the tales themselves. Am I forgetting anything? Are there any examples that I'm not thinking of? But I don't remember any example. We're told that it happens in the abstract from the beginning in the Book of Lost Tales. But I can't remember any story whose plot, whose plot depends upon the reincarnation of an elf through children, the rebirth of elves. I don't think I can't think of a single version. A couple of you are talking about Gorfindel, but that's a later problem. He's not even decided that the Gorfindel of that Elrond's Gorfindel is the same as the Gorfindel of Gondolin. Um, he's not even gotten himself out of that. He's not even it doesn't even seem necessary to have asked that question yet, but he's not he's not even resolved that question yet. So Gorfindel is not an example of where reincarnate besides which Gorfindel isn't born. I mean there's no reference to Gorfindel of the Lord of the Rings to his birth or rebirth. So how could the idea of physical rebirth in the body of an infant be said to be essential to that story at any point? Um Yeah. Anyway, um So it's just, it's just interesting to me. It's, it's a fascinating glimpse into something which seems... I don't know anybody, any Tolkien reader, who upon reading the history of the Lord of the Rings, the history of Middle-earth, sorry, for the first time, doesn't find the idea of reborn, reincarnated elves a little weird. Right? It seems to take everybody aback when they read it for the first time. They're like, whoa, for real? Tolkien said that elves are reborn in their children? Or grandchildren? Wild! Right? Um, and yet he felt that that was essential and ha and felt like it was going to do violence to the whole mythology to take that out. And that's interesting. That's interesting to me. There are lessons to be learned from that, I think. Anyway, okay. Let's, um, yeah, I won't go on. I'm going to stop because I'm keeping you late and I shouldn't. I'll say goodnight there. We just have one or two things to finish up, and then we are totally getting to Myths Transformed next time. And looking at that, the problems that Tolkien lets himself in for when he, because he won't break that last umbilical cord between his secondary world and the primary world. Anyway, more next time. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Talk to you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. 
If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.